Hello and welcome to the season premiere of VU Sports Wired. I'm Max Schneider alongside Simon Gibbs and Bobby Kent, our new freshman correspondent here for his first year on the program. We are so excited to come to you all semester with the best news in Vanderbilt sports, the best debates in Vanderbilt sports. It's all going to be right here on VU Sports Wired. We start this week, Vanderbilt, with a tough 31-6 loss at the Grove at Ole Miss. Later on, we'll talk about Vanderbilt's upcoming matchup against UNLV. We'll talk about a little soccer. They had a road win this past week against Georgia. We'll break down a little bit of the Vandy boys and the pros and talk about the California build down the line. But first, a tough loss at the hands of Ole Miss. Let's start by rolling the highlights. Vanderbilt, Ole Miss at the Grove. Vanderbilt looking to pick up their second win of the season. Ole Miss looking to get to 500 early on after a long run by John Reese Plumley. The Rebels tack on a field goal, go up 3-0 early on in this football game. Ensuing possession for Ole Miss. The keeper for Plumley, 33 yards out. He will not be caught. Plumley to the end zone, 10-0 Ole Miss after the extra point. Offensively for Vanderbilt, really a struggle all day, especially with Riley Neal in the pocket, you'll see here. Steps up in the pocket after a three-step drop and takes a sack. Riley Neal never really comfortable in the pocket. This offense really never could get into a rhythm. You'll see here again, Neal dropping back on third and one. Clueless takes another sack from Ole Miss. Too far to go for it on fourth down, so Ole Miss gets the football back. Here in the third, handoff to the stud freshman, Jerry and Ely, who breaks a tackle, and he is gone. 50, 40, 30, 20, 15, 10, breaks another tackle, and he is into the end zone. 17-6 Ole Miss. And from there, they would just pile it on. Next ensuing possession, handoff to Snoop Connor. Bye-bye, he's gone too. Ole Miss would finish the day with four rushing touchdowns, three, three touchdowns from their running backs, one from Plumlee. The offense picked up over 400 yards on the ground. Really no answer for, answer for them offensively or defensively for Vanderbilt. And then finally, last possession, Ole Miss gives the ball to their senior, Scotty Phillips. Phillips takes the handoff, goes right through the, through the middle, huge hole, takes it into the end zone, and that would be all for, for the Rebels. 31-6, to 6, Ole Miss really trounced them this week. I mean, yeah, this was, game was, was never was, close. That was rough. I, besides, besides halftime, 10-6, really the score felt a lot, looked a lot closer than this game felt. Oh, Vanderbilt never really seemed to be in this game, and you kind of saw that. Was, they were absolutely in the game. Yeah. Six at halftime. Right, that's what I mean, though. The score, I mean, yeah, it yeah, seemed yeah, yeah. like they were in this game, but it never even felt like a 10-6 right. game. No, it no. felt like Vanderbilt was getting blown out from the outset, especially with these long runs from Plumlee in the first half. I mean, that first drive, Plumlee rips off a 54-yard run, and you're thinking, oh, no, here comes the big play again. They showed it again in the second half, just giving up so many yards on the ground, and that's the frustrating part. 500-plus yards through the air a few weeks ago at Purdue, now 400-plus on the ground, I mean, if you're Vanderbilt, what do you take away from this game, especially defensively, because there were a lot of struggles. Absolutely. I mean, the first half, as I mentioned, 10-6 ball game, I really wasn't too worried with the performance. Um, the defense hadn't been too poor. The offense absolutely struggled to get a rhythm going. I mean, we saw on their first six possessions, punt, punt, field goal, punt, punt, field goal. That's not a rhythm you want to get into against a conference foe like Ole Miss. But I was even more worried in the second half, every time they ran the ball, they were getting yards at will. They averaged 9.4 yards per rush. At that rate, they could be getting a first down on almost every time they go to the ground. They didn't need to throw the ball. That's why they only completed 10 passes for 99 yards. They didn't have to look through the air. So obviously Harrison Smith, Vanderbilt's punter, got every rep he needed <laughs> and some because in that second half, the offense ended up with seven straight punts. No field goals and no touchdowns. So in the first half, I think the defense held their own. I didn't think there was too much to worry about other than the offense getting off to an awfully slow start. But it's this level of consistency that they haven't been able to reach. The defense couldn't keep it going, nor can you expect them to hold Mississippi Ole Miss to another 10 points in the second half. But then if the defense isn't going to hold their own, the offense has to convert. And of course, as we saw, Vanderbilt's big three couldn't get it done, but more so, none of their offense could get it done. Offensive line couldn't block the quarterback. The quarterbacks couldn't even get it done because Deuce Wallace stepped in once again, which we could be seeing more of <laughs> this week. Um, but ultimately, 
they had just 62 yards on the ground on 27 attempts, 202 yards in the air on 25 completions. But Simon, they limited the penalties. They did. And you know what? I'm impressed with that, and I'm glad, because this is the first time where I don't think Vanderbilt lost the game themselves, or at least, I can't say they would have won <laughs> against Georgia without the penalties, but I can't say it would have been a closer ball game. I can say the same about Purdue, but here, three penalties for what, 20-something yards? That's yeah, that was more of a non-factor. And I think also for a game that was supposed to be a barometer of sort of SEC play against opponents that were not powerhouses like LSU or Georgia, this is not good. I mean, if, if, you know, lose in game, this doesn't give me much confidence that we can reach a bowl the rest of the way. I mean, I don't see more than three or four wins the rest of the way. Um, and also, another concerning thing again, Jaron Pinckney did not get involved again at all. I mean, one catch for seven yards. We, we, I mean, I've said, people have said this all the time. He needs to be involved more and more. A preseason all-SEC tight end. I mean, I understand if he's frustrated. He very much definitely is. We saw that in last week's game. And also, um, as a whole, on the offense, they were 2 for 16 on third down. And you can't potentially think about beating a team when you're only 2 for 16 on third down. That is not great. And, and Keyshawn Vaughn, while well, he got 18 carries, rough, you know, similar to what he got last week, he was held to under 70 yards, which if he can't get going, the offense can't get going, it can't find a rhythm. And yes, you also fall behind very quickly in the second half, so the running game isn't is offered as much, but right. that doesn't help. I, my favorite stat is that in addition to the abysmal third down performance, they went two for three on fourth down. How does that work? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I guess a sense of urgency there. I, I like what you said about Vaughn, and I, I think it's troubling because the offense runs through him. I mean, this is a run-first offense, kind of by default, especially because yeah. Neal hasn't been able to really show what he can do in the downfield passing right. game. And I don't know if that's Godowski just lacking faith in Neal or Neal just not having the skills to be able to do it so that Godowski doesn't call those plays. But when you don't have a downfield passing attack, it really has to start with the run. It has to open up the passing game from there. And, and Ole Miss really cued on the run, and, and it helped them. Conversely, Vanderbilt did the opposite. And that was the real issue for Vanderbilt. You had to go into this game knowing Ole Miss with a freshman quarterback that has one start under his belt and with a, tri with a, with a triple-headed monster at running back with guys as good as Phillips, Ely, and Connor, that they were going to pound the rock, and they were going to try to do it all game. And they couldn't stop it. This is no longer no, DK not. cast. No, no not. this is not the air raid attack that Ole Miss usually has. This is a ground and pound team, and you knew that that's what's going to happen. And so when you come out on that first drive and Plumlee rips off a 54-yard run, next drive rips off a 33-yard touchdown, <laughs> and then in the second half, don't even get me started on the second half because <laughs> Mason's biggest problem with this program, and there have been a lot, and I'm a defender <laughs> of Mason, there have been a lot, the biggest problem, the single biggest, pro biggest problem, is that he doesn't make necessary halftime adjustments. Right. Yeah. He's never been able to make the necessary halftime adjustments. Mm -hmm. And so Vanderbilt's lucky to have gone into that half 10-6. For sure. They were well in that ball game, a game that they really didn't deserve to be only four and points away. And got points from. right before the half, too. So Absolutely. You have to believe momentum. you have some momentum. You're in a game that you really don't deserve to be in as much as you are. You have to go into that half saying, all right, they're running all over us. Let's fix this. Mm -hmm. right. And they come out in the second half, and it's way worse. <laughs> I mean, those three rushing touchdowns, Ely, Connor, <laughs> once they got past the first level, they were gone. There was no mm -hmm. one there. So it's, it's the pursuit of the ball that's a problem, and that's been a problem all season. But moreover, I think the problem is not being able to make that adjustment at halftime and understanding what your opponent wants to do so you can counteract it. I almost liken this to the bowl game last year against Baylor, where it was very clear that they have a mobile quarterback who they're going to have to contain. At halftime, he had scrambled around a lot. The only goal should be to stop him from running around, make him throw in the pocket, make him hand the ball off. They couldn't do that. He ran all over our defense again in the second half. And it seems like the same thing happened against Ole Miss. They knew going into the game, as you said, it's going to be a running game, yet they couldn't get it done at halftime. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Yep. Looking forward to UNLV this coming Sunday, 3.30 Central Time kickoff. Vanderbilt needs to right the ship this week, and, and it's coming against a 1-4 and four UNLV team. Vanderbilt opened as a 17-point favorite. The line's down to 14, so a lot of money pouring in on UNLV <laughs> this week <laughs> at plus 14. Guys, this is a game that Vanderbilt figures to win, a game that Vanderbilt should win as 14-point favorites. What does Vanderbilt have to do beyond just winning this football game to really show you that, that they're a new team going forward? Chunk yardage. It has to be chunk yardage. Mm -hmm. Something we really haven't seen them do all year, and when they do it, it's one, maybe two pickups a game. We haven't really seen an air raid offense. We haven't seen an air raid attempt 
at an offense. And against a team like UNLV, it's okay if you make a few mistakes. It's okay if Riley Neal throws the ball down the field for one, maybe two interceptions. They have to at least try, though. You have to think that after all this time of the two, three-yard passes, Riley Neal scrambling out of the pocket and throwing it out of bounds, they would finally try something down the field. So whether it's through the air or relying on, which I think is less of an effective strategy, relying on Keyshawn Vaughn to break through their defensive line to go 50 yards to the house, I mean, you've got to get and come up with something. And in this game, to me, it's going to be the, la uh, the downfield passing. I definitely think so. I definitely agree with you. I think Riley Neal has to try to make those throws downfield, or if it's him or Seuss Wallace, one of them has to make the throws downfield. That's going to help open up the offense, and it gives opportunities for the running game like they like to do and be a run-first offense. But I think you also have to get... Lipsko more involved. I mean, he has had, he had seven catches last week, but he's got to have even more. I think he's, he's got to be definitely more involved. You got to have Pinckney has to be involved. Yeah, the downfield passing game has to be more prominent in this game. Yeah, I mean, you guys talked about Neil being able to be active in the downfield passing game. Do you I mean, even think try. it's going to be yeah, Neil right, this week? Try it. Do you think, think that Neil gets Neil the, the start, start, or do you think? Neil from the start. Then do you I think, think so. it should be Neil? I think Mason has a lot of confidence in Neil. I mean, as we've seen that maybe it's really is that warranted. That's to be said, you know, to be debated, but. I think, it, I mean, Neil will probably get the start, in my opinion. I Should think so. I, interesting question. I yeah. wouldn't be yeah, surprised. About that. I wouldn't be surprised if Wallace is the guy in there on that first drive. I would. Even I would. if he's not, I, I think we will see Deuce Wallace in this game and not just at the end of the game when the score isn't close or, 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 or whatever. I expect to see him earlier in this football game, especially against earlier, a team, yeah. especially mm -hmm. against a team that, that Vanderbilt figures to be able to beat. This is the kind of game where you want to really be able to see what Deuce can do with first team reps. Mm -hmm. And that's the issue is that it's really hard to ask a quarterback to step into a game in the fourth quarter in a game that's not close, <laughs> yeah. in a game where they're not playing for anything. Inspire something. And yeah. to ask him to inspire an offense that frankly is uninspired. <laughs> I mean, every game you see four or five throws where receivers just have their head downs, heads down walking back because they, they just don't have confidence that the offense can get it done. So it's tough to step in and inspire that sort of offense late in games. So I expect to see Wallace earlier. I expect Mason to give him a real shot this game. You think a first half shot? I think he'll get a first half shot. I, I do. I really do. And I think also regardless, just one last point, I think regardless of who's in, the offense has to start fast. I mean, they started yes. fast against Northern no Illinois, starts. but they have to keep it up. I mean, we start, yep. start, Vanderbilt started fast in the first quarter, and then it kind of petered out. It has to continue the entire game. Yeah, that I mean, they started fast confidence. against LSU, too. I'm this more team, worried about down the, down the line yeah, in the second I mean, half. This team hasn't played a full game of football so far this season, so hopefully against UNLV they can play four quarters, two halves, get it done on both ends rather than just one. Absolutely. Minutes. Vanderbilt, UNLV, 3.30 Central Time this Saturday at Dudley Field. We're going to go into a new segment on our show. It's going to be three quick hitters. First, we'll start with Vanderbilt soccer, a 1-0 win over Georgia this past week, getting back into the win column after dropping three of four. Vanderbilt with another shutout. The defense was great again. The one goal coming off the header from Maddie Elwell. Simon, looking forward at this team, do you think this can catalyze a big run? Absolutely. I think they did everything they needed to heading into this game to come back from their skid. Because what we saw in previous games is that the defense, again, terrific. They were almost shutting out opponents, letting up one goal a game in three of their last four. Um, but what we saw in those games is that Vanderbilt would outshoot opponents by double digits, eight to ten shots more than their opponents, which made it abundantly clear that a lot of these shots from outside the box aren't really the type of shots you should be looking for. In this game, they only outshot Georgia eight to six. That's because those eight shots were smart shots. I believe there were only two taken from outside the box. So when you have you know, the opportunities that are on goal, from close, they're going to capitalize. And in this game, we saw them take smarter shots. So I think if they can continue to do that, this defense hasn't and should never be a problem, knock on wood. But this has been an elite defense with <laughs> continue making, uh, taking smart shots to convert their goals. I think they should be okay moving forward. I completely agree. You roll that momentum right into playing against Missouri and then right into at a ranked matchup at South Carolina. Absolutely. Vanderbilt Soccer takes on Missouri tomorrow at the Vanderbilt Soccer Complex. Moving from soccer to the, to the big leagues, Major League Baseball playoffs well underway, and the Vandy boys are showing out. I mean, what else is new? Vanderbilt alumni doing their thing in the pros. We saw Walker Bueller with a shutout this past week against the Washington Nationals. He'll pitch again tonight in a do-or-die game five. And then we saw Dansby Swanson, a guy who 
obviously was fantastic for this program, won a national championship with this program, won a Golden Spikes Award. He's coming back from an injury, stepped into the eight hole of the lineup, and really did the best he possibly could this series. What do you guys see from these two going forward? I know Swanson, as we speak, is getting eliminated from the playoffs after that <laughs> humongous first inning from the St. Louis Cardinals. But I mean, guys, Van Vanderbilt dominating in the majors. Is this a sign of what's to come for the next generation? Absolutely. I mean, we're only going to see more and more of this. You see the talent out of these teams. Uh, you know, the current MLB climate with, as it pertains to Vanderbilt is really a lot of those guys that were on the 2014 College World Series championship team. So fast forward a few years down the line, once this 2019 College Baseball World Series champion class advances their way through the minors, I think we'll be seeing upwards of 15, 20, 25 even players in the MLB. Because all these guys have the talent, the skill to at least get drafted. So once they get in the, their foot in the door, I really think it's about them working their way up and finding a place home. I definitely agree. I think it only helps that the program's prestige and it helps recruiting going forward. And yep. that's only that momentum's only going to build and it's going to snowball. Like Simon said, you're going to see. I think you're going to see more players and more talented players and more players are going to shine on the big stage like this in the postseason and in regular season games too as well. You're going to see a lot more players from Vanderbilt shining on the biggest stage in baseball. Finally, a shakeup in college athletics, a potential shakeup, especially in California, as the California government signed a bill into law this past month that would allow college athletes to make money off their name and likeness. That can come in the form of hiring agents. That can come in the form of endorsement deals, jersey sales, and more. Guys, what's your initial reaction to, the, to this bill, and do you think the NCAA is going to allow this to happen? I, I think that, this, that these type of things need to keep happening in as many states as possible. Now, whether the NCAA is going to be happy about it, I would say probably not. I mean, we saw before when this bill was kind of being put into thought, the NCAA was saying things like, "We will, you know, we will suspend, you know, California, state of California, team, California yeah. from playing, you know, po we'll put postseason bans, anything we can." Um, you know, the NCAA has famously been, you know, but a stickler, put their thumb on it and being like, "We're going to try to tamper any sort of chance because the, to for players to profit off their likeness because they are student athletes." But I think this is a step going forward, and you just need to see this legislation get rolling in more states. Max, I think this is great. It needs to happen in more states, as Bobby alluded to, but this is great for a number of reasons. First and foremost, a lot of these one and dones, and in Vanderbilt's case, Darius Garland and Simi Chateau, I mean, in Darius's case, he was a very clear top 10, if not top five, which he ended up being, draft pick at the time of declaring. So I understand his inclination to declare, but for someone like Simi, who is on the border of being drafted, if you have that extra paycheck, that extra money, so you're actually not losing the years that you could be doing in the NBA playing pro ball, I think it could keep them here. And then my second point is I have a Vanderbilt College Baseball World Series jersey that has JJ Boudet on the back. It is a fake jersey. It is so fake. I got it for $15 online. And I have no problem with saying that I got it because it says J.J. Bleday on the back. If Vanderbilt were to be able to sell those jerseys, give Bleday the profits, give Rocker the profits, give anyone the profits that at least has their name on the back, I mean, you stop the sales of these other jerseys. But more importantly, you're giving guys reason to stay here. Yep, absolutely. All right, thank you guys so much for tuning in. That was our quick hitter segment. We will be here every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Central Time to break down all things Vanderbilt sports, all news, all sports talk here at VU Sports Wired on Vanderbilt Television. From Bobby Kent and Simon Gibbs, I'm Max Schneider saying so long, and we'll see you next week.